So we will continue from uh, last time. We're discussing the uh, origin of the small populations in the universe. And uh, so this, this is the origins, of course, inflation, as we saw last time. And uh, I just apologize because inflation is a whole, uh, no, could take easily five lectures. So this is, this is going to be a very, very superficial uh, tour uh, on inflation. So inflation uh, was uh, originally motivated by uh, problems related to the standard cosmology. And one of the problems was the causality problem that uh, I uh, briefly discussed uh, yesterday. It's just the fact that uh, there are, so I can probably just show this picture again. Uh, sorry. Uh, it's just the fact that the last scattering surface represented here by this black line at the redshift of uh, 1100, there were regions that were never in causal contact from the Big Bang and they just didn't have time to be in causal contact. So there's no reason why when the light ar ar uh, comes to us from these two uh, different regions here that were never in thermal uh, contact or causal contact, why they should have the same temperature. This was uh, called the uh, causality problem. And in fact, uh, it's a single exercise to show that uh, regions that have uh, been in, in, in uh, causal contact uh, today would have uh, 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 an angular size of one degree. And this is the scale basically of the CMB, it's one, one degree. So inflation was then proposed to solve this problem, and there were other problems like the uh, magnetic monopole problem that. Uh, People thought it was at that time. Anyway, so inflation uh, was proposed, uh, I guess, uh, early 80s. And it's a period of very fast uh, exponential expansion of the universe where a single small patch can fill the whole horizon of the coupling. So we're, that's, that's the idea. We're going to calculate exactly uh, how, how much inflation you need for this to happen for a very small patch in the whole horizon of the coupling. And, uh, uh, but however, inflation has many, uh, has a features that are very uh, interesting. It also predicts that the universe is spatially flat uh, as observed, just because it stretches any curvature away. It also provides uh, the quantum fluctuations that are, uh, that are seeds for the inhomogeneities in the universe. So the basic idea, as I was discussing yesterday, is very similar to what we discussed uh, when we talked about dark energy. Uh, Scalar field. The idea is to have a scalar field uh, where, uh, in some um, period of time, uh, the potential is much larger than the kinetic energy. So you have an equation of state which is uh, close to minus one, and which, as we saw from Friedman's equation, results in an exponential expansion, exponential uh, scale factor grows exponentially. So the, uh, the field starts here. There should be some time. Uh, Roll down the potential, roll slowly. So there are some ways, some ways to parameterize the slow roll of the uh, um, of the scalar field, and then at some point starts rolling faster. So that is uh, there's conditions, oral conditions, are no longer valid, and that that's when inflation ends because the kinetic energy here becomes comparable to the uh, potential energy. The part where the uh, um, the heating occurs, as uh, when inflation happens. Uh, uh, universe, as I said, expands exponentially. So everything is diluted, matter is diluted, radiation is diluted. So the universe is basically empty at the end of inflation. So you need to reheat. And that's how you reheat by these uh, coherent oscillations of the scalar field in a process called reheat. And I, I, I just showed this for fun because uh, you know, this, this was a simple picture, but they're like pictures of models of inflation. And more than one scalar field, uh, et cetera. So um, um, there's some classification of these models in this uh, paper. So as I mentioned, also inflation must end. So the uh, oscillating field around the minimum of potential produces uh, what is called the reheating of the universe because it's equivalent, and that can be easily shown actually, gas of particles. And the particles uh, uh, of the inflaton field, because uh, it also predicts the uh, um, relations that we measure. We can uh, say that the particle mass around 10 to 12 G. That decays into radiation. Uh, and the idea is that these inflaton particles decay into radiation. Uh, it's a model-dependent thing. Um, 
that's how the uh, radiation is created after it. It can be more complicated. There could be something called preheating processes, something that happens before uh, the process of coherent oscillations because of some um, abilities. So this is called preheating. So it's just for you to know that there are other ways to uh, reheat the universe in addition to this coherent oscillation. And then one question you may ask is, what is the temperature uh, after the reheating process? So we don't know what's the temperature, again. And the only bound we have, as I said before, is that the, you know, the, the probe of the universe uh, that exposes to the Big Bang we have right now is Big Bang photosynthesis, and that happens at around 1 GeV. So the only thing we can for sure, for sure say is that the temperature must be uh, larger than the, uh, the temperature when Big Bang photosynthesis uh, happened, which is around 1 GeV. So now I want to discuss uh, very briefly also how much inflation is needed to solve the uh, causality problem. So the idea is to require that the observable universe today, for instance, and then we are characterizing the size of the co-moving uh, size of the uh, universe by a co-moving point. So this is uh, the co-moving bubble horizon. That's what uh, two days ago. So suppose the uh, uh, the co-moving size of the Hubble horizon today uh, was inside a co-moving Hubble radius at the beginning of inflation. So I called I here the initial state of inflation. So the beginning of the inflation. The idea is that this co-moving scale, uh, that is us here, we were contained in a very small uh, causal uh, Hubble radius uh, at the beginning of the inflation. So this is the condition to solve the causality problem, and we're going to see what uh, are the consequences of this condition. So I want to remind you that after inflation ends, the universe is radiation dominated, and when the universe is radiation dominated, we also saw a couple lectures ago the Hubble, the Hubble factor goes like the inverse uh, square of the scale factor. And let's assume, just for the sake of argument, this, this goes until today. So, uh, so this is today, zero is today, and this is the end of inflation here. So if you take the ratio of these uh, co-moving scales uh, between the end of inflation and today, this is just the ratio of the scale factor at the end of inflation, end of inflation, today. And uh, as also, we also saw, this is proportion, this uh, scale factor goes inversely proportional to the temperature of the universe. And the temperature today is, uh, is T0, which is the usual 2.7 Kelvin. And the temperature at the end of inflation, uh, when we have reheating, is the reheating temperature, which we call T sub R. So that's the reheating temperature. And that's what the scales are. Therefore, uh, we want the, uh, uh, again, we want the, uh, uh, our moving uh, Hubble radius to be inside the moving Hubble radius in the beginning of inflation. We just saw that using this relation, I can, I can uh, relate the moving uh, Hubble radius today to the moving Hubble radius at the end of inflation. That's the relation. Just plug this in here, and then you can uh, finally, using that uh, during inflation, uh, Hubble is approximately constant, so the uh, uh, um, so that the uh, Hubble parameter the, at the beginning of inflation is approximately the same as at the end of inflation. You just get uh, this very simple relation between the scale factor, um, the difference of the scale factor in the beginning of inflation at the end of inflation. That's just the ratio of the reheating temperature to the temperature today. So as we saw, the uh, during inflation, the scale factor grows exponentially. So one uh, quantity that we usually uh, talk about is the number of e-folds, you know? so the logarithm of the ratio of the scale factor. So more exponentially, how, many, how much e-folds uh, this, this uh, it grows. So the number of e-folds, which is this uh, logarithm here, is just the logarithm of the uh, re reheating temperature to the temperature today. And again, we don't know what the re reheating temperature is, but let's say, okay, it's between one uh, uh, GeV to 10 to the 15 GeV. So this is a log, so this will not change too much. Uh, so this is around uh, from 30 to 60 or something. And usually, 
one takes a uh, number of folds to be 50. But again, um, it has to be larger than 60, let's say, okay? Uh, it can be anything larger than 60 to solve the causality problem. Um, all right, are there any questions uh, up to this point? Giovanni? I don't see any questions. Okay, so, so this is a very simple calculation that shows you that in order to solve the causality problem, and uh, the amount of inflation you should have. This will come back a little bit uh, later. So uh, again, very quickly, I show you how uh, inflation, not how, but uh, the type of perturbations that uh, inflation generates in the universe. Um, so the idea is that uh, this is the background Einstein equation, and this is the perturbed Einstein equation. So when uh, so we solved this in the Freeman Robertson Walker uh, metric uh, in the first lecture, but if we want to compute the perturbations, uh, in the, we have to solve the perturbed Einstein's equation. We have to perturb the energy momentum tensor. We have to perturb the, uh, the Einstein tensor or the metric if you want uh, to see how perturbations evolve. So actually, this this will come back uh, uh, in a little later uh, when I talk about evolution. I just want to say that we want we have to perturb the metric, and, and the background metric is Friedman Lemaitre and Robertson Walker. Then you have this perturbation here, and in principle, this perturbation can be uh, anything. Uh, so um, we uh, write this perturbation in terms of a scalar perturbation, a vector perturbation, and a tensor perturbation. Um, not all, the, all of these are independent. Uh, there is uh, some issue with gauge freedom in these perturbations that I have to. Consider it doesn't really matter. I just want to mention that the, uh, the scalar perturbations are responsible for density perturbations that we observe today. Factor perturbations are usually not important. Uh, we can show that they uh, decay rapidly; they don't grow. They're not important today. And tensor perturbations will give rise to primordial gravitational waves, uh, which we hope to detect one day. They're not been detected yet. So uh, when you perturb also in the energy momentum tensor, uh, you have to uh, perturb the scalar field uh, in the background uh, plus some quantum fluctuations. And then there's a whole, uh, this would take a few lectures to show that uh, the size of the quantum fluctuations is set by the only uh, scale of the problem, which is the uh, double parameter. So one can show, and this is a couple of lectures to show, that the uh, fluctuations, so this is the variance of the fluctuations of the scalar field, uh, is related to the Hubble parameter uh, at, uh, during the inflation. So the inflation models are, are great. They predict that uh, the universe is spatially flat, solve the causality problem, and they generate this almost Gaussian. Didn't show that, but this is uh, this is a Gaussian. It, it, but this is almost Gaussian. There's, very, very small non Gaussianity that can be also computed, um, but it's mostly Gaussian. And they generate an almost Gaussian, almost scale invariant fluctuations because uh, Hubble here is basically scale independent, so there's no scale, so it's scale invariant. Small deviations, but they're very small. And basically, scale invariant fluctuations and uh, generate both scalar and tensor perturbations. That's important to keep in mind, even though we have not measured yet the tensor. Perturbations. And this is also very important the, uh, um, the fact that you, given an inflation potential or, or infl inflation model, some parameters, and can predict the spectrum of scalar and tensor perturbations. So you give me a model for inflation, your favorite model, some potential, you can, pre you can compute everything. You can compute the number of e folds, you can compute the spectrum of scalar and tensor perturbations. And the scalar density perturbations is the things that will grow and, and, and give rise to what we observe today, galaxies, and stuff, so what we call the large scale structure of the universe. And, and the spectrum of scalar and tensor perturbations can be characterized in the following way. Suppose we have these perturbations here and that are functions, of course, of space and time. We can Fourier uh, decompose them. In them into Fourier modes here, that, uh, so delta of k is on scale of k, and time t is this way. And then we can define something that's very uh, useful and, and common to, uh, to work with, which is, which is called the uh, power spectrum. So 
The power spectrum is defined as the correlation of two fluctuations of different scales. And one can show that uh, this, uh, because of the uh, Gaussian properties, only, only when the scales are the same, you have a contribution that's the power spectrum. So as I said before, the uh, uh, inflation predicts a primordial power spectrum, scalar and tensor perturbations. And they are parameterized in this way. Well, remember, this is the, sorry, this is the power spectrum defined in terms of the perturbations here. And these perturbations are computed and uh, give inflation. So the power spectrum P of K can be parameterized uh, in the following way. So there are two power spectra. First of all, there's one power, one power spectra for scalar perturbations and one power spectrum for tensor perturbations. So the spectrum for scalar perturbations, uh, we, we, we parameterize uh, as an amplitude times a scale, K, to some index, Ns minus one. And this Ns is called the uh, scalar spectral index and As is called the scalar amplitude. For the tensor perturbation is the same thing, but for historical reasons, here we put an S minus one, and here we uh, without it minus one. And uh, so this is a, uh, a spectral index for the tensor perturbations, and this is the amplitude for the tensor perturbations. And one can uh, construct a ratio of the tensor perturbations to the scalar perturbations, and that's called the R uh, in the literature. So R is the ratio of tensor to scalar perturbations. And again, given an inflation model, this factor R here can be computed in terms of something I didn't discuss. It's something that's determined by its potential, the so-called slow, slow row parameters. Okay, so not only this can be computed, but most importantly, this can be uh, measured in principle. And, and this is the result uh, from uh, the satellite plank. So this comes from looking at the cosmic microwave background. I will, I will show some more details about the spectrum, uh, sorry, the, uh, power, the angular power spectrum, the cosmic microwave background. But what I want to show in this plot is the fall. So these are uh, bounds on inflationary models. So what you see here in the horizontal axis is the, um, is the spectral index of the scalar perturbations, this NS which was predicted to be uh, very close to one, the totally scale independent uh, power spectrum. Um, was also called Harrison's, still called Harrison's autology spectrum. And here in the uh, vertical axis, tensor to scalar ratios are here that I mentioned before. Okay. And, and what is plotted here are the predictions of different, um, so, uh, of different uh, cosmological, different inflationary models. And you see here, so let's take this line. So this line, if you go and look here, uh, it's uh, a potential that is a polynomial phi to the Q, okay? So it's a polynomial inflation model with phi Q. And you see two uh, balls here. And the two balls is because the predictions here depend on the amount of inflation. So here you see that uh, they vary, uh, Planck varies the, uh, this amount of inflation by uh, from 50 to 60. Uh, N is the number of efforts, okay? The variation that uh, uh, Planck makes. Um, right, so this is phi squared, this black line, uh, sorry, phi cubed, this black line is phi squared, etc. And those are the bounds. Now you may have heard that uh, there was a, and a couple of years ago, uh, a claim that a measurement of uh, this tensor to scalar ratio was uh, actually performed. You see, this there's not a there's an upper bound here. There's no uh, measurement. It, it, everything is consistent and zero, right? It means that there's only an upper bound for this uh, ratio of tensor to scalar uh, amplitudes. Now, you may have heard that uh, a couple of years ago, an experiment called BICEP. Uh, claim to have detected uh, tensor modes, uh, gravitational wave tensor modes, um, because they uh, impact the, um, they can change the way the polarization of the uh, CMD. So uh, this uh, experiment called BICEP, which is located in the South Pole, is sensitive to this polarization. So they claim that uh, they uh, 
they have found uh, the, um, the tensor modes um, of, of inflation. That would be incredible. But unfortunately, and, um, the, the, uh, the origin of their measurement was not the primordial uh, tensor perturbations, but it was some um, dust uh, in the universe that uh, um, mimic the same signal. So this happens a lot in, in physics, as you probably know. And uh, and this, so, but I, so something I also want to show, this is Planck 2015. So Planck, up taking date in 2015, and they have these papers. But the, la the last uh, analysis of Planck is 2018. And this is 2018. And uh, as you can see, uh, 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 this region here has uh, shrank a bit. So now this is less than um, 0.15 um, for some uh, combinations of uh, different combinations of uh, data. And in fact, this ratio R here, if you combine bicep and Planck in 2018, uh, uh, the upper bound now is, is, is very small, actually, it's 0.056 at 95% confidence level. So it, it's really uh, excluding uh, more and more models of inflation, if you want. Okay. Um, so, yes, I forgot to mention, this is, uh, these are different uh, combinations of. Uh, of uh, data from, uh, from the satellite. So not only uh, temperature, temperature, but also polarizations and lensing, et cetera. And the blue one is combining with other external uh, data. So this is this bound of 0.56 comes from here. So if you trust this bound, uh, uh, combining all the data, you see that phi square, uh, this what's called natural inflation, is basically excluded. Is it? Okay, very good. So this is just to show how can we get information about inflation uh, from uh, studying, for instance, the cosmic magnitude background. And the bound on the ratio of tensor to scalar perturbations, uh, say from Planck, um, also imply bounds on the energy scale of the inflation epoch. This is an important information to have. And this bound here of uh, this, this one I mentioned here, 0.056, implies that uh, the potential energy inflation smaller than 1.6 times 10 to 16 GeV to the power of 4, and, this, and the uh, Hubble inflation is less than 2.5 times 10 to the minus 5 of the Planck mass. So this, this gives you the information that uh, inflation, um, uh, this has to be at a scale smaller than, than, than those. Those are also results from. Um, from these uh, measurements of this tensor to scalar perturbation. Okay, so uh, it's a good time to stop now because I'm going to change gears a little bit. So if there are any questions. Uh, there is a question from Jenny. She asks, uh, what are the alpha tractors? So alpha tractors uh, is, an, again, another model of, of inflation. I'm not very familiar with the, this model. Uh, it was proposed by Andre Linde and collaborators. Um, so I, I really can't say much because I, I never uh, worked with alpha tractors. So I'm sorry. Um, and there are many, many models for inflation, and uh, some are even motivated by um, string theory. And I'm not mistaken, alpha attractors is one case of models that are motivated by string theory. Uh, they said Question from Maria de Lourdes ask, uh, what is the hybrid inflation? So hybrid inflation is when you have two scalar fields and, uh, and then you can have uh, different situations where one is responsible for inflation and when the other changes sign in, in the potential. So uh, hybrid inflation is a, is a general name when you have not only one scalar field, but two scalar fields. Also proposed by Linde, if I remember correctly. Uh, Roberto Caroli asks, uh, which is a physical argument for vector perturbation to be neglected at cosmological level? Yeah, then you, you have to, uh, physical argument is that you, you compute the vector perturbations and you can show that they decrease with time, they don't increase. So that's the physical argument, why you can neglect them. And uh, Sudip Sudipta Show asks, 
how R is related to potential or inflation? Very good. So this is something I, I didn't have time to go into. And uh, so, yeah. So if you give me a potential uh, for a very simple, yeah, we can give me something more complicated. But uh, let me see, I, I didn't write it down. But uh, again, uh, a course on inflation would take five lectures at least. So I really apologize for being very, very sketchy. But all these parameters here, A of S, A of T, N S, and T, can be computed given a potential. So given a potential you, and, and, uh, and solving the equations of motion for the uh, field, yeah, and you can compute everything. And, and there are some um, parameters that characterize uh, this, this uh, slow row of the, uh, of the scalar field or inflation, which are called the slow row parameters. And you can compute uh, R, for instance, in terms of the slow row parameters. And the slow row parameters are given in terms of derivatives of the potential and the potential. So I apologize uh, for not uh, doing this. I could I could have done it. It would take more time. Maybe you can show the the slides on delta phi related to H. Yeah. So maybe from here you can argue that quantum fluctuations are regulated by H just by uncertainty principle. And the yes. R is the quantum fluctuation, the graviton, which will also go with H. And H yes. is basically the size of the potential during inflation. Yes, that's correct. For the tensor perturbations, for uh, scalar perturbations, there's a factor of uh, one over the yeah. slow row. Um, yeah, so, so, so Dipta show ask, is there any quantum gravity effect? Uh, so what's, what we are doing here in order to compute this is computing quantum effects in a uh, non-flat background. So um, uh, um, in principle, quantum gravity, of course, is not taken into account uh, here. And just to say that the, you know, the area scales much below the Planck problem. Posteriori, I, I showed you that uh, the scales are uh, below the Planck mass, into the minus five to all the Planck mass. So we don't have to worry about quantum gravity. I guess it depends how you define quantum gravity. Yeah, right. <laughs> you can say that R is quantum gravity. Oh, because of the fluctuations, yes. Um, the fluctuation of the graviton. Yes, yes. Um, Right, but but here, so we're considering this as fluctuations, um, right? Um, yeah, but we're not quantizing. Uh, we're not quantizing the field here. So those are um, two classical fluctuations. No. Um, no, the, the uh, for the for the quantum for the field phi, and then we make a full quantum field theory. And then we compute the implication of this fluctuation in the fluctuation of the uh, um, of the metric through Einstein's equation. Uh, Bruno Siqueira also asks: Does energy momentum tensor perturbations affect energy conservation? Yes, so uh, energy conservation is a consequence of uh, Einstein gravity, if you want, because Einstein's equation, because the, uh, 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 the identity that the energy momentum tensor is conserved, is the, uh, the divergence of the energy momentum tensor is zero because of a Bianchi identity. So yeah. see any more questions so I guess you can okay so now let's switch gears a little bit I'm, I'm going to the third set of lectures here um, so I want to talk a little bit more about the perturbed universe 
So um, the plan here is to talk uh, about growth of perturbations, and then I give a simple example in the Newtonian universe, and again talk about power spectrum. But I, what I really want to do in this part of the lecture is to get more and more uh, uh, close to the observations, especially uh, I want to concentrate uh, on the uh, experiment that I'm working, which is the dark energy survey. First of all, uh, we just saw that inflation um, can generate small density perturbations in the early universe. And these are the perturbations that uh, grow and originate the structures that we now observe. And I don't know if I mentioned before, but these early fluctuations were detected for the first time in the cosmic microwave background around 1991 by the Kobe satellite. And they're very small. They're one part in 100,000. And the detection was, uh, was uh, really incredible. And, and uh, it was a very important detection and uh, gave the Nobel Prize to uh, uh, George Smoot and John Mather in 2006 for uh, the discovery of black body form and, and isotropy of the cosmic microwave background radiation. The idea, this is just an illustration, and uh, this is supposed to be the last scattering surface, and the fact that you have, uh, you know, uh, different colors here uh, just represents the different temperatures, which are uh, fluctuations. And these things evolve through gravity to form uh, the structures that we measure today. And again, uh, we want to measure the evolution of perturbations. This is again perturbation, the uh, uh, the uh, perturbations in the Einstein uh, equation. Um, and it's not possible to fully describe this uh, nonlinear regime of perturbations in, in general relativity. So it's not possible to solve these equations in general. Uh, uh, so uh, one resorts to numerical simulations, uh, like large n-body simulations, and they're mostly done using a Newtonian physics. Uh, so you just simulate how small perturbations evolve using an n-body uh, uh, simulation. And, and in the beginning, uh, uh, I mean, uh, not in the beginning, but uh, only if you're only, you know, most of the matter in the universe is the dark matter, and it's cold dark matter. So sometimes only cold dark matter is considered in this um, in these simulations. It's much simpler to consider the, evol the evolution of, of cold dark matter because they, uh, they interact very weakly. So they're basically, uh, they do not dissipate. Now, baryons, which are the things uh, that we're made out, they're more complicated, but of course, they're very important, and uh, but they're more, more costly to take into account in these uh, simulations. So, I'll just give you a snapshot of one of the simulations and show the actual simulation. People usually start with a certain number of particles, millions, sometimes billions of particles in blocks, and just let them evolve under Newtonian gravity to see what happens, okay? And what happens is that structure forms, uh, as you can see, these are snapshots um, um, in this distribution of particles. So you can actually simulate this. This is uh, again from uh, Andrei Kratsov. Um, so we start with some a set of initial conditions as some uh, red shift, I think was around 10, 11, and let it evolve. And we start with very uh, small perturbations and let it evolve. And what you see is that uh, structures form, I mean, filaments and uh, galaxies are, uh, each point maybe it's a galaxy and uh, they form these filaments in the sky uh, with voids, et cetera. And, and this is not, amazingly enough, this is very similar to what we measure in the, in the real universe, this type of structure, very similar, these filaments and connected, uh, Disconnected filaments, uh, voids, etc. This is amazing. This is only dark matter in a, in a uh, uh, Newtonian physics. Of course, there are more, uh, much more um, sophisticated simulations. This is just one example. It's called the Eagle simulation, which is the largest simulation so far, and this includes variants. And and just amazing because uh, you know if you, if you zoom in, you see things that uh, really look like galaxies. I, I remember um, one, one of the persons that's responsible for the simulation 
um, show this image to, uh, to an astronomer, and the astronomer thought this was a real galaxy. Just to show how, how sophisticated these uh, simulations have uh, become. And uh, you know, with the uh, advancing computers, etc., right? it's amazing. But uh, at the moment, I just want to gain some intuition. So we do perturbations in the Newtonian universe and, uh, and, and study small perturbations. So um, perturbations can be analytically studied when they are small so because we can use perturbation theory. It can be done, this, uh, uh, evolution perturbations, all perturbations can be studied in full general relativity. Um, but here for this course, what I'm going to show you uh, is that at small, uh, scale smaller than the Hubble radius. And for non-relativistic matter, one can simplify the problem and, and you can use only Newtonian physics. And what is the Newtonian physics behind these perturbations? It's just fluid dynamics and expanding universe. So I just review a little bit of fluid dynamics very quickly. So fluid dynamics uh, is, uh, deals with an uh, element of a fluid with certain mass density rho and velocity u at a position r and a given time t. And the equations that control the dynamics of this fluid are the continuity equation, which is basic conservation of matter. So this is non relativistic fluids. And this is the uh, continuity equation. Euler equation, which is like F equals ma. So the force is the gravitational force. And the gradient of pressure is also a force. And this is like uh, um, um, Derivative of the velocity, so this is like acceleration, and the Poisson equation, which is the uh, 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 it's an equation for the gravitational potential that is sourced by gravity, so it's sourced by the energy density. So the, the, these three equations, uh, amazingly enough, you can get a picture of what's going on. So uh, as usual, it's convenient to work in moving coordinates. So instead of R here, uh, I use a moving coordinate called X, um, which is just R divided by the scale factor. And velocities can be written in terms of these moving variables as uh, this is just a Hubble flow uh, and a peculiar velocity, which is just derivative of X. Now, if you consider small perturbations around some background quantities, so averages like so, and you plug this into the equations, and you take the, uh, it's, a, it's really incredible. You can show that if you take P equals zero, which is the case for uh, non relativistic matter, and you define uh, perturbation like so, and the perturbation matter as being rho minus the average divided by the average, it's very, it's, it's not difficult to show that the equation that you get for the perturbation. So it's a time evolution. Of the perturbation. Time evolution depends on the uh, Hubble parameter. This is depends on time also and depends on the amount of matter in the universe. And what I want to show you is the following is that there are some very uh, simple cases where you can uh, easily solve these equations. So suppose you're in a matter dominated universe. Matter dominated means that omega matter is one. And we saw before that uh, the scale factor goes like t to the two third, which means that Hubble goes like two over three t. So we just substitute this into this equation. It's an exercise. You see that the perturbation in matter grows like the scale factor. So this is a very simple way of showing that the perturbation grows as a scale factor. You can also show, and that's an, another interesting limit, that suppose the universe is dominated by a cosmological constant. Dominated by a cosmological constant means that the density of matter is, is negligible compared to the density of the cosmological constant. So we put this at zero. We know that the scale factor in a lambda dominated universe grows exponentially and Hubble is a constant. So just putting this in the equation, you see that perturbations do not grow in a universe that is dominated by cosmological Very, very easy results to get from the simple equations, uh, the simple equation that I wrote. Now, this can be shown also in simulations. And this is a plot that I, I took from an old, old scientific American paper. Even. And, and 
In this plot, from left to right are three snapshots of a, of a in-body simulation with different components in the universe. So they all have the same initial conditions. But if you go from left to and, and then the top row has uh, is an universe dominated by dark energy. The uh, uh, middle row has 75% of dark energy, and the um, bottom row has no dark energy. And what you see is that as time goes by, if you if you don't have dark energy, you have much more structure, and you have a universe dominated by dark energy, you don't have uh, any structure, basically. And this was uh, uh, an argument that we Weinberg used uh, in the 80s, if I remember correctly, uh, an entropic argument of, uh, for an upper value of the cosmological constant. It could not be larger than something because if the cosmological constant dominated uh, the evolution of the universe, you would not have structures formed. So you, don't, you would not have galaxies around and we would, we would not be around to, uh, to make observations. So this was one of the first uses of the uh, anthropic argument uh, in cosmology or the cosmological concept. Now, uh, I, I want to describe a little bit better these fluctuations and the way to do it. Uh, so I want to introduce what's called the power spectrum. I already mentioned the power spectrum, but now I'm going to concentrate a little bit more on the power spectrum. So the fluctuations, again, are characterized by a density contrast out of X. And this can be thought a, as a, um, uh, as I said, the uh, um, perturbations generated during inflation are almost Gaussian. So we interpret this delta of X as being a Gaussian random field. And uh, a Gaussian random field are characterized by its uh, first two moments. So the um, average and the variance. So the average, we just take the average here, and by construction, the average of this perturbation is zero, just because if you take the average here, the average of rho of x is rho bar, so rho bar minus rho bar is zero, so the average is zero. So you only need to characterize these fluctuations by the uh, uh, two-point function, which is the variance, and by uh, homogeneity and isotropy, this is just one function of r, and this is called the two-point uh, spatial correlation. It depends on the uh, distance of an interpretation of this two point correlation function is the following that suppose you're observing two volumes in space, you want to find it, uh, the probability of having access of, uh, of uh, clustering of matter in these volumes. So, if there's no correlation, it's just the product of the volumes, but if there's a correlation, so if there's a random distribution, it's just one. If there is some correlation, uh, is this uh, two point correlation function, spatial correlation? So it gives you an excess or a deficit of finding uh, more matter or less matter clustered uh, at the scale R. So one can work with the, uh, 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 the uh, correlation, the spatial correlation function, or one can also work with something called the power spectrum just the Fourier transform of the uh, spatial correlation function. The power spectrum I already introduced and is related to the uh, uh, correlation function by a simple Fourier transform. And one can uh, analyze data using either the correlation function space or the power spectrum. So as I, as, I, as I just said, it's possible to work with either spatial correlation function or the power spectrum. And one thing that's interesting to notice is that is the following. Suppose there's a very sharp peak in the correlation function in galaxies. For instance. There's a, a scale where you expect galaxies uh, to be separated from with more, uh, um, more statistical weight. Here, of course, I'm exaggerating. I'm saying, suppose there's a scale, very sharp, sharply peak scale. Uh, so at that position, R star. So this means that there is a very specific, very physical scale that, uh, that, that types the separation of galaxies. Now, if you take the Fourier transform for the power spectrum, what you see <laughs> is just, uh, it's just these oscillations here. Which so a sharp peak in uh, configuration space 
uh, uh, is related to oscillations in, uh, in harmonic space, K space. And, uh, so if you remember, I talked about this uh, issue feature called the barium acoustic oscillations. And this barium acoustic oscillations is exactly related to this fact, the fact that there is a, a preferred scale for galaxy distribution in Fourier space it is related to oscillations. So one thing I want to show also is that the power spectrum, this P of K here, sensitive to new physics. This, if you can observe the uh, power spectrum, you can actually uh, uh, put bounds on new physics. Just an example of a power spectrum, P of K, as a function of the wave vector K um, for different models of dark matter. In fact, this is the, uh, uh, the mass of, uh, of the dark matter particle. So it's a light mass compared to the usual V scale. And in this case, dark matter will not be totally uh, non relativistic, will not be totally cold. Uh, this is examples of what we call warm dark matter. And you can see that warm dark matter suppresses the uh, structure formation just because if they're very light, for instance, they just uh, stream away from these perturbations. And, and as opposed to cold dark matter, they don't collapse. So they suppress structure formation at the small scales. And that's what this plot is showing. As you increase the mass, this effect is uh, less and less pronounced. But in fact, if you can measure this, uh, you could uh, have a hint about the mass of, the, uh, of dark matter particles. There's a possibility of having uh, light, uh, warm dark matter particles as opposed to cold dark matter. This is very important. Uh, if you have a new model, not only of dark matter, but uh, even dark energy can affect uh, the power spectrum. You have to uh, be able to uh, compute the power spectrum. How do you compute the power spectrum? How, how you get, can get plots like this? By the way, I just want to mention, this is very small uh, oscillations here. I don't know if you can see, but these are very small oscillations. This what is called the baryon acoustic oscillation. This has to do with the, the baryons, which are the, sub, the very subdominant component uh, of matter, and that's why it's very it's a very small effect in the power uh, in the in matter power spectrum. So before stopping for questions, I just want to show you, you know, how you compute these things. So. Um, in order to compute the uh, realistic power spectrum in the linear region, so this is something I, I want to emphasize because I wrote it here. This is the linear power spectrum. So this is computed using linear general relativity, which is valid only when the perturbations are small. And in fact, uh, when you are going at this scale, one of the difficulties that in this scale here of uh, say megaparsec, so this is a scale that would correspond to a megaparsec. So, um, um, so these are small scales, cosmologically speaking, where um, um, perturbations are much larger than uh, one, and they would expect a linear power spectrum to work. So this is one of the main problems. This is a purely um, theoretical um, um, But again, so what I want to comment is that to obtain this realistic power spectrum, the linear regime of general relativity, uh, what is needed is to solve a set of coupled Boltzmann equations and explain the details. So you cannot do this analytically. <laughs> and uh, there are two main codes, they're publicly available and you can download and run them. One is called CAM, uh, which is, well, it stands for code for anisotropies in the microwave background. And a more recent code is called CLASS, which is called, co uh, it's an acronym for cosmic linear and isotropy solvency. Oh, the both of them are public, and uh, there are lectures about them. Class is uh, uh, Janis Gug is the person, main person behind class, and he has uh, his page, and uh, there are lots of uh, resources on how you make a plot like this. Okay, he's using this this type of codes. Okay, so let's stop for questions now. Yes, there is. Couple of questions. So, um, how does the power spectrum depend on dark matter mass? Is there any expression for that? 
Yes. So if dark matter is made out is of non-relativistic particles, meaning cold dark matter, uh, as long as you are in cold dark matter regime, it doesn't depend on the mass anymore. Okay. Only when the uh, dark matter becomes very light and it's not even cold anymore, but it's warm, you have this kind of spread. It also depends, uh, to a less, and this I'm going to show later on, also depends on neutrino masses. And that's very interesting. And, uh, I'm going to mention this later. Um, Jenny asks, are the disturbances generated for the formation of galaxies scalar or tensor? Yes, so for formation of galaxies, you're interested in the scalar perturbations. The tensor perturbation, just to complement, uh, gives rise to the uh, gravitational waves, primordial gravitational waves that were not detected yet. Ask, can you please repeat why, for small k, the lines in the plot get closer? Yes. Uh, so for small k here, uh, you are in a regime. So yeah, that's very good. I have to explain this a little better. So here, uh, uh, this uh, wave ve vector here defines a scale in the universe. And the scale is basically inversely proportional to k. So if you're looking at, uh, 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 at the small k, uh, small wave vectors are actually looking at very large scales. So at very large scales, uh, and the effect of these differences here uh, are not important. Um, because the, uh, these particles travel and, and, and it's, uh, in these very large scales uh, without any problem. They become non-relativistic uh, only at small scales. So there, is a, there is this particular scale here, which, uh, which is called the uh, free streaming scale. And that's when these particles become non-relativistic and, and when they suppress um, the formation of structure. Um, so if the scale is smaller than uh, the scale of when the particle becomes non-relativistic is when the suppression happens. So if you are here, you're, this, the, the particles are free, uh, they, they're not free streaming and they're very large scales. So basically there is no difference. The difference comes when they, they are uh, able to free stream and suppress the perturbations. So maybe that was not clear. Uh, um, what it means to fall in this, these particles um, they, uh, they, they are relativistic, but uh, uh, at some point when the universe uh, cools down, they become non-relativistic and then, then they behave like cold dark matter. So there's a particular scale uh, where they suppress uh, uh, structure formation. And that particular scale is usually, it's a, it's a small scale. If you are smaller than that scale, uh, you, you have no problem. Ask uh, relative to the question of before about the, the, the mass of dark matter. So only the relativistic degree of freedom affect power spectrum. Uh, uh, so again, if dark matter affects the power spectrum, yes. But if dark matter is non-relativistic, it doesn't matter the mass. Okay. Because it's already non-relativistic, it behaves like uh, it doesn't have any um, it doesn't have any. If, it's not, if the dark matter is non-relativistic, and if you increase the mass, it will still be non-relativistic. So that doesn't change anything. Okay. So what changes is when you have uh, particles that are are light. So this is kilo electron volt, and uh, and then. Uh, Physical reason why they change things is that uh, when particles are relativistic, they don't stay in a perturbation. They tend to uh, get away, and that the technical term is they tend to free stream. And when they do that, they carry away, they smooth the perturbations. And that's why you have this suppression here. And the lighter the, 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 uh, the, uh, the dark matter mass is, the more they, the more time they are uh, relativistic, and hence 
the suppression is, is larger. It starts before and then it gets larger. So I hope that uh, was a bit more clear. Uh, Victor Rock asks, uh, on dark energy, is there a limit on which it, it is not possible to form structures? Uh, yes, so I showed in that plot uh, here, where, um, and where structures cannot form. <laughs> so if dark energy is 0.99%, structures just don't form. And so uh, Weinberg uh, put this bound, uh, I don't remember if it was 0.99, but there's a bound that you can make uh, in order for structures not to form. It's not a very solid bound, but it, it, it is a bound. Oh yeah, so if you have too much dark energy, um, uh, structures will not form, that's it. River asks, what information is contained in the correlation function of more than two points, for example, three or four? Very good. So the assumption that uh, the fields are Gaussian uh, tells us that uh, all the information is in one and two point functions. Okay. Now, I told you that uh, there could be deviations from Gaussianity. So in the simplest model of inflation with one scalar field, the deviations are very, very small. They were computed actually by Maldon Sander many years ago. Now, if there are more, if there's more than one field uh, uh, um, participating in the inflationary process, then you can have a stronger non gaussianity So um, in that case, the signature for non gaussianity is the higher order correlation functions. Absolutely right. Now, another thing I want to mention, since you're talking about uh, other or, uh, correlation functions of higher order, is, is the following, is that, uh, you know, we're going to measure uh, uh, P, this uh, correlate, the power spec, let's say the, the power spec. This is something we're going to measure. But then we want to estimate the, uh, the error in the measurement. So the error in the measurement uh, goes by the name of covariance matrix, which I'm going to talk later. It's actually the product of two of these things. So it's, it's uh, the, um, the error of the measurement of the uh, angular correlation function is a four point correlation. Uh, error in the measurement of a two point correlation function is a four point correlation function that we, uh, we need to go through. Uh, Jenny asks, is the division of scalar and tensile perturbation related to the size of the phenomena studied? Why one perturbation is considered scalar or tensile? So the uh, a scalar or tensile perturbation has to do exactly with the, uh, uh, the metric perturbation. Right? So the metric perturbations, when we you classify, so the metric I, I showed in the, um, here or the other, I think it was the other one, or was it here? Was it? Sorry, the metric. So when you do perturbations here uh, on the left hand side, this is the Einstein tensor. So this is related to the metric. And you can decompose perturbations in the metric scalar, vector, and tensor. So, uh, so they're different and they evolve differently. So. Okay, so you continue. So I just want to mention again, I, I mentioned very briefly this, uh, this this little wiggles here. And this little wiggles is what is called the barrier acoustic oscillation. So, um, so remember, I just mentioned also that uh, when you see things that oscillate, that is probably related to a scale in the problem, right, in the observation. Third scale. Third scale in the uh, in the correlation function leads to oscillations in the power spectrum, and you see some oscillations here. So this is called the barring acoustic oscillation. So the question is, is there a preferred scale <laughs> in the galaxy distribution? And as you probably know by now, because we have done we have, we have been doing this in all the lectures, yes, there is a preferred scale. 
and that's the sum horizon decoupling, which, by the way, is the same scale of the CMB, but look, look at a, a larger redshift, uh, sorry, smaller redshift closer to us. And, and, uh, and there is an easy way, easy way to, to, uh, to show how the scale happens. And, this, and, and uh, I'll show you later, but uh, just in words is that for recombination, virus and photons are in tightly coupled from a single fluid and they go at the speed, close the speed of light. But dark matter is not coupled. Um, so it's just, and it's not relativistic at the coupling. At, at recombination, so it's just then still. The baryons move, and baryons are pushed by the photon fluid, okay? So they move. At some point, baryons stop moving because of the coupling. So when the coupling happens, baryons just stand still, okay? Neutrinos, are, they just uh, go away, okay? But uh, what, you, what you want to, what you need to focus is the behavior of dark matter and behavior of baryons. So you have, suppose you have a common perturbation of baryons and dark matter, if you want neutrinos and photons. Uh, you start with a bump in everything, and then the dark matter stands still, doesn't move, go moving coordinates, whereas baryons and fault, uh, baryons are dragged by photons. And they're dragged until the decoupling occurs, and then the photons go away and baryons stay, and that's exactly the uh, sound horizon decoupling that generates this scale. So there is an animation here. Maybe it's hard to see, but uh, something that starts, uh, you will run again, but something that starts with all perturbations uh, concentrated in the origin, and then uh, uh, you have to concentrate on the gas, which are baryons, uh, we should start again, no? Yeah. Here is, is the type, is the photon and baryon uh, fluid, and then there's the decoupling, and then baryons stay still. So these are baryons, and this the dark line is, is dark matter, which is dominant. And, and what you see is that in the end, there is this characteristic, characteristic scale for baryons to be distributed in the universe. And this is the acoustic, uh, acoustic horizon at the top. This is another uh, animation to show this effect. They're supposed to be the variants and they freeze out. I mean, they just stand still after, after the decoupling. So in principle, it would be easy to see this feature, right? Most variants are in this kind of circle here with respect to uh, the main perturbation of dark matter. Uh, and you can easily compute this uh, uh, standard ruler in the sky. Is, is, again, it's the sound horizon. I think we already computed the sound horizon decoupling around 150 megaparsecs. Now, of course, things are more complicated. So you have actually a superposition of these things happening. So in order to find these uh, characteristic scales, you have to look statistically. And uh, this is also an uh, artistic uh, description of the circles in the sky, but you have many circles. And uh, the idea is to find these scales uh, statistically. Now, the first detection of this uh, uh, peak in the, uh, or oscillation, a peak in real space, an oscillation in harmonic space uh, of the, the so-called barrier oscillation was done in 2005. So if you are in, in real space here, in, in, so if you're looking at the correlation function, it's really a bump in the uh, two-point correlation function as a, fun as a function of the separation. And this is the bump here. If you're looking at harmonic space, are these oscillations? Okay. So this was the first discovery uh, in, in 2005. Now, after that, of course, uh, data has improved, and this is a peak that's a little bit more pronounced. This is already almost five sigma, so this is the particle physics standard for a discovery <laughs> or detection of the peak. But now it's much better. Uh, there's some techniques called reconstruction. And you get some uh, some peaks that are in, um, significance even larger than 5C. Okay. So this is uh, 2014, 2015. So this has been detected, okay? And this is used because the position of this peak uh, uh, depends on uh, cosmology, depends on number of variants, etc. Depends on the south horizon decoupling. So. Um, the sound horizon decoupling, as I said, is the same scale as, 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 as the CMB, only a different redshift. Um, 
And so it's not surprising that, uh, for instance, the determination of the Hubble uh, parameter H0 uh, is the same, uh, is comparable uh, if you do using variant acoustic oscillations or, or using CMD. Just, just uh, some remarks. Okay, so now I'm going to go a little bit more. Uh, how do we find out the parameters that describe the universe okay? using uh, the cosmic microwave background first? So I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, what can be called the six parameter universe. Uh, so uh, the, uh, um, the cosmic microwave background angular power spectrum is determined to a high precision from a model. If you give me a model, I can compute the, um, the uh, angular power spectrum, which is measured by, uh, by Planck. So uh, the analysis that uh, the Planck team did uh, used as a baseline model, a spatially flat on the CDM cosmology with a power law spectrum of scalar perturbations. So what are the three parameters of this model? So the three parameters of, of this very simple cosmological model, which is the standard cosmological model, and the baseline parameters are the Hubble uh, parameter, H0, the scale, sorry, the amplitude of scalar perturbations, A sub S, the spectral index of scalar perturbations, N sub S, then the amount of baryons, and then the amount of cold dark matter, and something called the optical depth, which is related to um, some observations. So this is not a cosmological parameter, it's related to the fact uh, that the universe has reionized when you have uh, production. So those are the baseline parameters. Remember, it's a flat universe. They also go beyond the baseline parameters um, by, um, uh, by allowing the possibility of a non-zero neutrino mass. So this, in this case, neutrino, neutrinos are massless, allowing for the possibility of equation state that is not equal to minus one, which is the equation, so something that's not the cosmological constant, and also allowing for curvature. Those are beyond baseline model, uh, baseline parameters. Okay, they, they do this uh, analysis. These are uh, um, the uh, data from the Planck, uh, Planck 2015 analysis. This is the spectrum, uh, angular uh, power spectrum for the temperature, temperature, the difference in temperatures in the sky. Function of instead of K, here is L because you are in two dimensions. So this, uh, um, and the L from the spherical harmonics, L. Um, and uh, you see this beautiful uh, data here. Okay, it gets a little bit noisy at low values of L, and that's because uh, something called cosmic variance, you don't have uh, many realizations. You have a large uh, statistical error here. But if you go to large Ls, uh, the errors are, are much, much smaller. And what you see here is the red line. And the red, the red line is, a beautiful, is in beautiful agreement with the blue dots, and the blue dots are the measurements, right? So the red line is the theory. So when you make the uh, fit of the theory with six parameters to the measurements, you get this amazing fit. That's how uh, the cosmological parameters are determined from the measurements of the cosmic microwave background. Okay. This is how, by doing this very complicated measurement and very complicated fit of, uh, of the measurement to a theory. This is by no means easy to do. I'm, I'm just saying the bottom line, telling you what the bottom line is. Um, the, you, you have to look at the papers. The papers are uh, very detailed. They're, there's more than one paper. There's like each time Planck releases an analysis, like 15 papers or something. Okay, so these are the results uh, of Plan 2015. I want to mention that's Plan 2015 because I, I, I want to compare with Plan 2018 in the next slide. So these are uh, the results from the fits and the fits uh, that they do depends on what are the measurements that they're taking into account. Sometimes they take into account only the temperature, temperature and uh, low, low L polarization. And sometimes they combine everything. So the, of course, the uh, most um, stringent bounds uh, 
come from um, combine everything. Uh, all, all the measurements that they have done. Also, this I don't know, I don't know if you can read this. This is external data. So they also combine with DAO measurements and uh, supernova, uh, not supernova, but other measurements as well. And these are the results that I want to point out for you. This is the results on the Hubble um, parameter that they got, 67 plus or minus 46. Uh, the, uh, the amount of dark energy, omega lambda, in the universe, which is around 70%, and the amount of matter. So this is total matter. Um, meaning dark matter plus variables, okay, which is around 0.3. Um, so this is uh, um, um, when I showed in my first lecture that pi, the pi plot with the different contributions from the universe, basically comes from here, okay, from these measurements of the cosmic microwave background and from this fits uh, to the theory. Now, if you go beyond uh, and the, uh, uh, the baseline models, they can put also bounds on the other parameters like curvature. So curvature is very small, consistently zero. And I want to call your attention to uh, the sum of masses of neutrinos in electron volts, which is uh, smaller than 1.94 electron volts. The effective number of degrees of freedom, 3.04. Um, and other parameters. W, for instance, the equation of state is very close to minus one. So this was 2015. So what changed in 2018? Not much, but the results got more precise. Uh, so this is uh, the results from 2018 analysis. Uh, again, curvature is very small, um, system is zero. The neutrino mass bounds become, uh, they, they become, became even stronger. If you remember here, it was 1 to 194, and here is 1 to 0, uh, 0 0.120 electron volts. The affected number of degrees of freedom also became more consistent with the standard model, which if you remember is 2.04 or something. And yeah, and the identical synthesis, everything is agreed. So these are the latest results from Planck, and the, not only the latest, it's the last. <laughs> They're not going to analyze data. And, so now I want to talk a little bit more about neutrinos in cosmology. So it's a good point to stop and uh, ask for questions. So there is a question from uh, Lucas Magno. How precise is the measurement of the sound horizon at the coupling? And how does it compare to the value predicted by theory? Will it be possible? So, yeah, so it continues. <laughs> Sorry? The, sorry, the question continues. Yes. Would it be possible to use it to put the model independent bounds on dark matter couplings to variance and recombination? Yes. Yeah. So, um, so the first question is how well we can compute the uh, sound horizon of the coupling. So that's the basic quantity that enters in, in this calculation. And given a model, it can be computed very, very precise. So what uh, uh, I think I mentioned before, one of the main observables that uh, uh, CMB has is this angular scale, which is characteristic of CMB, which is close to one degree. And this angular scale is the ratio of this um, horizon, uh, sound horizon decoupling to the angular distance from us to the CMB last scattering surface. So this can compute. This can be computed in models, and that's, uh, of course, this is what enters in this uh, in this feeds. Now, these feeds were done uh, assuming a lambda CDM model, and sometimes with, uh, even with zero neutrino masses, zero curvature. But they can open to have uh, neutrino masses and curvature and, uh, and a collision of state non equal to minus one. Now, if you include, if you want to include uh, new interactions of um, uh, dark matter with baryons, um, you have to change everything. You have to change the code that uh, generated the uh, linear power spectrum. So CAM or PAS, they have to be changed in order to include this possibility. You have to redo all the analysis. Um, it's possible. Um, 
I'm not sure if people have done it. Uh, I've seen papers about possible couplings of dark matter with variants, um, but I haven't read them in detail. But possibly they have uh, done this. So, but plan collaboration have not done it. So someone someone outside the collaboration may have done it. Jenny asked, can the fluid in the simulation also have viscosity? What will be the physical meaning of that viscosity? Um, yes. So in fact, yeah, neutrino perturbations, they carry some viscosity. And um, the viscosity, of course, is taken into account by these uh, perturbations in the uh, energy momentum tensor. Uh, so the non-diagonal elements of the energy momentum tensor are related to, to, to anisotropic stresses, which are related to viscosity. Um, so, um, right, in some fluids, they, they, there is some, uh, some viscosity that must, in perturbations that must, must that are taking it. Um, so deep task, can you comment on the different, different peaks in the, D yeah. yeah, so you see these different peaks. And again, as I said, this is this is not unexpected because uh, when you have a, a character so when you have a characteristic scale in the Fourier space, harmonic space, you have different peaks. Now uh, the position of the first peak is related to that scale of uh, of the CMB, which is the one degree scale. And the heights of the peaks are also related to uh, some ratios of omega matter, omega baryons, etc. So um, these are all you. Uh, of course, when you have a theory, you can compute all the peaks uh, directly from from your theory. Um, but you, you can make an argument that the peaks are sensitive to some ratios of, uh, say, the quantity of baryons or the quantity of, of dark matter, because they have some origins. No more questions? No, not yet. OK. So again, this is really a, a beautiful story, very complicated, which I, of course, I'm not making justice uh, to this story. But this is um, um, how we, uh, this is one of the most precise way, ways of getting information about the universe using the cosmic microwave battery. I want to spend. Uh, five minutes about neutrino mass in cosmology because this is exciting. So of course you heard about uh, neutrino uh, masses in particle physics. So neutrinos, they oscillate, which means they have masses and the uh, mass eigenstates are usually denoted by M1 and M2P. But experiments of neutrino oscillations are sensitive to the difference of the square mass of, of, of. So there's still an open question whether uh, the ordering of neutrino masses are what's called the normal ordering. So one to three uh, in, in, in here, mass goes uh, vertically or inverted hierarchy where M3 is the class. And a cosmology is uh, sensitive uh, to the sum of uh, neutrino masses. Ah, no, sorry. Uh, Cosmology is sensitive to the sum of neutrino masses from CMB, for instance, because they uh, they uh, they decrease the uh, uh, fluctuations because they free they don't they don't don't uh, clump together. So if you call sigma here the sum of the three neutrino masses, I just showed you that the official Planck bound, assuming a six-parameter lambda CDM, combined with some external data, is this amazing number of uh, 0.1. 20.120 million electron volts. Okay, and just to compare, uh, you know, the oops, something happened here. But there was the, a very recent experiment by Catherine. I don't know if you heard about this, where they measure. Uh, they don't measure. They uh, they, uh, they have. They want to see the uh, effect of uh, neutrino masses in the beta decay of tritium. There was a recent, uh, uh, the first result of Catherine, which is uh, not the final result, 
gives you a bound on the, an effective mass of the electron neutrino of the order of one electron volt, right? So 10 times larger than this. And they plan to go down to 0.2 electron volts. So what I want to say is that the best bounds are in cosmology of, of neutrinos, uh, no masses. Now, something that's interesting is that the sum of neutrino masses, you can show this easily, can be written in different ways for normal hierarchy and inverted hierarchy. So M0, M1, and uh, M0 is the lightest uh, neutrino. And it's interesting to notice that the lower bound on, on this uh, sum of neutrino masses uh, depends on neutrino mass hierarchy because the lower bound is when you set this M0 to zero. And the lower bound, <laughs> given the experimental data on the uh, mass differences, the lower bound depends whether you are in inverted hierarchy or normal hierarchy. And, and, and from, oscillation from oscillation data, this lower bound is 58.5 uh, mil electron volts for normal hierarchy and 98.6 for inverted hierarchy. Just a simple exercise that uh, you, you can do. Write the sum of the neutrino masses in terms of, uh, of the mass differences squares, etc. Um, so this is in, this is interesting because if from cosmology we find that the sum of neutrino masses is smaller than 0 0.098, then we can determine. I mean, we can exclude the inverted hierarchy. So this is something that uh, people will try to do in accelerators, but I think in cosmology we will do uh, first. And so we are almost there because remember the bound is uh, 0.12, and and we're Getting to 0 0.01. Uh, we're getting there, so stay tuned. Okay, so in my remaining uh, 20 minutes, right, Giovanni? No, 15 minutes? Yeah, t 10 minutes. Yeah. 10 minutes? Okay, so now I want to talk about my favorite experiment, which is dark energy survey. So now we're uh, switching gears from looking at the cosmic microwave background to looking at galaxies, the distribution of galaxies in the universe. So not very far away in redshift. So, we're talking, so remember that CMB, we're talking about redshifts of 1,000. Here, we're, now we're, we're going to talk about redshifts of order one, okay? And, and so we're looking at uh, surveys that uh, are, um, making catalogs of galaxies and, and looking at distributions of galaxies. There were many, uh, so you probably heard about Sloan Digital Sky Survey, BOSS, it was Dark Energy Survey, and there's some Spanish ones and Brazilian, uh, Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument that's going to start uh, soon, and the uh, Legacy Survey Space and Time, which is also going to start soon, Euclid, etc. There are many uh, experiments that either uh, already took data or plan to take data very soon. Now, distribution of galaxies in the universe, they provide information about the growth of perturbation. So you can modify, uh, you can test dark energy models or five gravity models. You can give more information about dark matter. For instance, hot dark matter is already ruled out. And you can provide a standard rulers for best of inclusive oscillations. I like this um, uh, slide because, uh, you know, this is school for particle physics. So I like to make this comparison between accelerators and uh, large-scale uh, galaxy surveys. So in accelerators, you want to go to higher, the highest possible energies in order to explore new phenomena. And in, uh, in, in galaxy surveys, you want to go to the highest redshifts in order to explore new phenomena. I, I like to compare energy to redshift. You also want to have large luminosities to collect data in accelerators. And in astronomy, you want to have a large area and large observation time to collect more data. In accelerators, you have to calibrate your energy uh, resolution. And, and as you need to have errors, and we also have redshift errors. So we want to measure redshifts. Sometimes it's difficult to measure redshifts, so there are errors. So we need to, uh, so in order to uh, compute an energy resolution, you need energy calibration. We also need the redshift calibration with objects with non redshifts. In accelerators, when you select data, you make some cuts, like uh, transverse momentum cuts, etc. In galaxy surveys, you also make uh, cuts, uh, magnitude cuts, mass the uh, survey, etc. 
And in accelerators, you have final data set. In the scale, uh, in galaxy surveys, you have something called catalogs. And in accelerators, you, you look for uh, bumps, like the Higgs bump hunting. And we can also look for uh, bumps, like in the variable oscillation bumps. And uh, it's funny that the uh, accelerators, perturbation theory works fine at high energies because of synthetic freedom. And, and in um, galaxy surveys, um, gravitational perturbation theory works fine because uh, when you look at uh, high uh, redshifts, perturbations are small, so perturbation theory works fine. So I like this uh, analogy. So I'm a member of the Dark Energy Survey Collaboration, which was around 300 scientists around the world. Brazil is part of this linear uh, laboratory. So it's a project that we uh, already finished, so survey 5,000 uh, degrees, of, so one-eighth of the sky. Um, we have more than 300 million galaxies now in catalogs, 100,000 clusters of galaxies, thousands of supernovas. We measured uh, the redshift uh, using a technique called photometric redshift, which I can talk about uh, later uh, if you want. We use a telescope, we use a telescope called Blanco Telescope, four meter telescope in Chile, and a digital camera with 700, uh, 570 megapixels. So this is the timeline of the project. Uh, and, and the announcement of opportunity was uh, done in 2003. And the construction, the R&D of the camera started in 2004 to 84 uh, years. The camera construction took three years. The first light uh, on the camera was 2012. We took data for five or six years and uh, the observations ended in the uh, of last year. Of the, this is the, where the Blanco telescope is, where the Dark Energy Survey is. It's in La Serena near, uh, near Santiago. So it's near La Serena, Santiago is uh, here in Chile. This is a picture of the uh, uh, camera. So this 570 uh, megapixel camera, which can take a picture of 100,000 galaxies up to 8 billion uh, years away. This is a close up picture with the CCDs. This is uh, how the CCDs are, are, are organized. And uh, this is a picture of a galaxy. This is how the moon would look like in the field of view, just to show that it's a large field of view. This is a totally unscientific picture, but beautiful. It's a comet. Uh, it generates a uh, sort of data measurement, right? Each exposure, so we take pictures. And each picture take, uh, takes, uh, generates 500 megabytes. So there are 300 uh, pictures per night, they were, no? And 150 gigabytes per night were transfer processes in, uh, in the US. We will skip that and we will skip that. And the footprint, I go a bit quick because I don't have much time. There are more than 300 papers already published by the Dark Energy Survey Collaboration. It's the largest contiguous mass map of the universe. It's covered uh, almost double the number of Milky Way or satellite galaxies, which is important for uh, dark matter searches. And discover quasars, etc. Found optical counterpart of gravitational waves that already showed in the picture. So many, many discoveries. So uh, the uh, amount of uh, satellite galaxies that were discovered uh, by um, the Dark Energy Survey when, when, when it was uh, first. Okay. So how do we get from uh, um, from observations to uh, parameters uh, in DES? So the main goal is to determine what is the best model that describes our universe. So there are uh, easy steps to follow. You pick an observational probe, pick a model, compute predictions from the model for a given set of parameters, get some data, compare model predictions with data, and find the best model with the corresponding values of the parameters. That's very easy. Actually, it's not easy at all. So we put everything in this uh, so-called likelihood function which depends on the parameters. So this is the theoretical prediction of some observable, which depends on parameters. And here are the measurements, observables. And here's something called the covariance matrix, which uh, model the, uh, the errors. And we just have to maximize this function. The problem is that uh, maximize the likelihood or minimize this component. Um, sounds pretty easy. It's very, very complicated. And I, I want to give you an idea of, of why this is complicated. First, uh, uh, we need to be precise and accurate. Um, so we need to uh, make sure that uh, we don't have any systematic errors. And uh, I guess I just keep many things because uh, I don't have much time. Um, 
So we measure BAO in dark energy survey. Um, sorry, this is a paper that we led actually. We uh, people in Sao Paulo, uh, Hugo Camacho at all. We led the, the BAO paper using angular power spectrum in the year one data. But I just keep uh, many things because um, how much time do I have? Uh, well, one minute or two minutes. Two minutes, okay. So this is just to show you how complicated things are. So these are the cosmological parameters. In addition to the cosmological parameters, we have to carry about uh, other parameters that characterize systematic errors that we don't know about. So when we make estimates about cosmological parameters, we have to take this into account. So when you maximize, when you try to maximize the likelihood function, there are like almost 30 parameters. So it's a 30 dimensional uh, space. So you have to use Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, to use the, to, to, to do that. This is just some results uh, from the Darkness survey. And uh, these are some parameters related to the amplitude of perturbations uh, at a scale of eight megaparsecs and the uh, density of matter in the universe. And this is compared to results from the Dark Energy Survey alone, from Planck and the combination. And the, first, the first thing I want you to notice that the areas here of Planck and that's year one are comparable. Important. First time that measurements from the late time universe are comparable from results uh, of CMB. Results from CMB are pristine, are very clean. And results from dark from galaxy surveys are much much dirtier and difficult to analyze. And this is a results also for the uh, uh, a model which has a non uh, state that's not minus one, so WCDM. And the result that we got uh, from the S is minus one point zero zero errors. And I remember the reaction from Scott Doddleson. Uh, when this thing was shown, um, when uh, you know, we had a blinding uh, analysis, and then when this was unblinded, we got this result, and the reaction was, there goes the Nobel Prize, because if this were not minus one, we got the Nobel Prize. So we all also uh, studied some extensions, neutrino masses, test of gravity. I don't have time to go into that. And I just want to tell you that the future uh, LS, uh, so dark energy survey is finished, but we're still working on the year three. Very, uh, we will have the year three results very soon, and then the final results uh, are following. But the future is uh, 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 it's near. So we are also uh, members of the uh, what is now called Legacy Survey of Space and Time. Uh, it's in the Rubin Observatory. So this, uh, this uh, picture taken uh, one month ago is well under construction. Um, and, and this is also in Chile, and it's a mountain just in front of the mountain where uh, Dark Energy Survey was done. And this would take, uh, with, it's a uh, function for 10 years, and this would be an amazing uh, experiment to uh, find more information about dark energy and dark energy. So in conclusion, uh, cosmology has become a precision data-driven science in the past 30 years. Cosmology tests many models of particle physics. New experiments are taking data now, and many are planned. Uh, and it's a, it's, it's a very exciting time. Uh, let's hope that we have more surprises in, in cosmology. And for those of you that are interested uh, in more details about cosmology, we have a, a school, also a, a school, a joint school of a, a paper and a CV Trieste in cosmology. So this is really specialized in cosmology in February of, la of next year. So um, stay tuned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rogerio. So there is a question by Sudipta. Does KV sterile neutrino affect the power spectrum? Um, yeah, so sterile neutrinos are uh, a candidate for warm dark matter. Of course, it depends. When you say sterile neutrinos, you have to tell me what is the mass of the sterile neutrinos, you know, how are they produced in the universe, because it's not easy to produce sterile neutrinos. Um, but yeah, so sterile neutrinos are a prime candidate for warm dark matter. And in that, in that way, yes, they can change the power spectrum. Other questions? Please ask questions because Rogerio will not be 
to the to the Q and A, but the principle will be around the next week anyway. So I'll be I'll be around next week. You can ask uh, next week also. So I have to apologize. It was a lot of information, little time, and, uh, and and not much detail. Sorry, sorry about that. But I hope you got an idea of uh, how cosmology can uh, test particle physics. So deep, so deep tasks. Can one constraint some number of sterile neutrinos? Uh, I don't think so. Usually, one assumes one uh, sterile neutrino. Again, it depends on masses. It depends on you know how they're produced. But in general, the simplest model is to assume one sterile neutrino to be warm dark matter. Well, I guess uh, no, there is one question about Jenny. And body simulation use for a different. Uh, I, I think so. So uh, I'm not expert on n simulations. There are uh, polls that are public. One's called Gadget. You can take a look. Uh, it's not simple. Okay? It's also complicated to have these n simulations. But I think they, they, they use uh, finite distance. OK, so I guess maybe we can wrap up for today to, to the lecture. Uh, so I'll say that, thank you very much, Rogerio. Thank and you for the questions and for listening. For an uh, excellent course. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll uh, rejoin in one hour and a half for the